Hello, my name is Michelle Morand. I'm a precision cancer educator and advocate, and I'm here with the cancer guy, Alexander Rowland, the precision cancer research expert. And uh, he wants to share with you some information about a new drug or a new, new trial that was just released. Uh, Alex, tell us all about it. Yes, um, uh, we've done a few things on small cell lung cancers lately. Uh, there's been some advances both in the um, first line treatment and um, different areas of small cell cancer treatment, but this is uh, a treatment that applies directly to an antibody drug conjugate, which as you know, I'm a huge fan of, uh, in heavily pretreated small cell lung cancers. And this is an area where there really hasn't been a lot of development or advances in a long time. So uh, once again, ADC's hitting it out of the park. I thought we'd talk about that. Okay, sounds good. So this is for people who, ha who have small cell lung cancer, specifically um, heavily pretreated. What does that actually mean? Or are you going to get into that? It means they've had at least two, you know, sometimes three lines of previous chemotherapy. Um, as, as a cancer progresses and becomes more diverse, you deal with a lot of heterogeneity. And what that means is there's a lot of variation between the individual uh, tumors in the body. But not only that, but the actual individual uh, cells within a tumor can vary quite significantly. And so therefore the chance of one or two different um, specific drugs is gonna, you know, it's gonna impact part of the tumors or it's, you know, some of the tumor um, burden, but it's not gonna affect all of them. And so in heavily pretreated cancers, it's really tough um, to be able to take care of all of the sub colonies and the subpopulations mm. because there's gonna be, a, you know, quite a few different diverse subpopulations that require their own unique drug um, targeting. Sure. And that's, I guess, one of the things that ADCs is able to kind of get around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. For so those uh, haven't, I just want to interrupt. Sorry, Alex. For sure. those of you who haven't yet seen any of the information about ADCs, um, there will be a link to some of the earlier videos where Alex is really talking about the technology, what they are and how they, how they work and why they work so well. So uh, those links will be associated in, in the comments of this video. Yeah. So this is a new target, a uh, relatively new target. It's got the B7 homolog 3 or B7-H3. It's a transmembrane protein um, similar to a cell surface receptor. And it's been shown to be overexpressed in several tumor types. Um, I believe in this study, they looked at non-small cell lung cancers, small cell lung cancers, and prostate cancers. Um, however, you know, small cell lung cancers, the ones that are sort of an orphan cancer, and so I want to focus on that for this video. So 66, roughly 66% or two thirds of small cell lung cancers have uh, previously been shown to have high expression of B7H3 or you know moderate to high expression. And so therefore it makes a perfect target for that type of cancer with an ADC that targets that. Um, more importantly, um, moderate to high expression of B7H3 is also associated with a very worse prognosis. Um, it's, it results in much faster disease progression and lower survival. So it's a negative prognostic feature, um, mm -hmm. typically in these cancers. Um, this new drug, in ifinatamab um, the main, the first, um, the first part of the name is the antibody that targets this B7H3, and you can see that because it says MAB, uh, monoclonal antibody, in the end of the word. And then the second part is Durex TCAN. It's a type of chemotherapy agent. And so uh, basically this is an ADC that delivers and binds to the B7 homolog on the tumor cells and then um, injects this Durex TCAN into the tumor cells. Okay. So a little primer on how antibody drug conjugates work. Uh, this is a tumor cell. Um, you can see the B7H4 uh, homolog there. And then you can see the antibody drug conjugate which is that uh, red Y thing. And then the, uh, the drug, Durex TCAN, is in the yellow. And so basically it binds onto that, uh, goes, gets brought into the cell and basically kills the cell from inside out. Um, now, some, some of these drugs, I'm not sure about this particular drug because I haven't looked into it too much, but some of them have what's called bystander effect where they actually release the drug after they've killed that cell and they go on to kill the neighboring cell, and that's the bystander effect. So I use that slide because many of these drugs are being designed to have bystander effect. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, this trial, DS7300-A-J101 clinical trial, um, it was a basket study, as I mentioned. Um, it was in heavily pretreated patients. Um, we're focusing on the heavily pretreated small cell lung cancer patients with advanced tumors. Um, and uh, analysis included 22 patients. It was about 200, maybe 210 patients altogether in this trial. And out of that, 22 patients um, had small cell lung cancers. Now, interestingly enough, in this trial, and I'm starting to see this a lot more in um, ADC clinical trials, is they they didn't focus, they didn't uh, test the patients for the B7H3 expression. Um, and that is pretty, you know, that's something that we're starting to see more of. Um, the reasons could be diverse. Maybe they didn't have a good tumor sample. Um, you know, sometimes small cell lung cancers, it's hard to get a good tumor sample. Uh, it could also be that the, the drug company wanted to see how it would work in patients that didn't have B7H3. And in general, I think what they're trying to show is, hey, listen, if we can do this without testing the patients, um, you know, then we can sell more of the drug. And I think that's kind of probably the, the motivating factor of, of treating Thing, uh, treating patients this way. But you're um, saying, it, but what you said earlier about this being present, known to be present in 66 yeah. plus percent, yeah. um, it's a pretty safe bet that the, that the majority is. of patients are going to have this. Totally. Although yeah. I, just so you know, folks watching at home, we would not recommend you try a drug without knowing for sure you had the molecular features and it was going to work for you. We would always make sure that we had done thorough testing and that we knew for a fact it was going to serve you. But in this trial, they guessed. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so these uh, these patients, these 22 patients had received a median of two prior lines of therapy, uh, mostly platinum-based chemotherapy that's the standard for um, small cell lung cancers and immune therapy, which is being used more and more often in small cell lung cancers. So they were heavily pretreated and the average was two prior lines. So I'm sure some patients had a lot more. So in other words, these are patients that really didn't have any options. Yeah. There wasn't anything that was gonna work for them. Uh, chemotherapy is not that effective in this type of cancer and often immune therapy isn't either. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is kind of a bit of a game changer for these patients. Um, the confirmed responses were achieved in 52% of patients. And I think that's really good. I mean, you know, for non-select patients, I think that's great. Um, and the complete responses were 4.8. I would wow. postulate that that 4.8 uh, were probably had high expression of um, the, the B7 homolog. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not completely confident in the methodology of testing for these sort of proteins that are typically done in clinical trials. They're usually done through immunohistochemistry, which is not that accurate. Uh, we use RNA expression testing, uh, much more accurate. Um, so I think some of these trials are actually going to suffer from uh, stratification of the actual biomarkers, just because, you know, there's not always a tumor sample or the tumor sample's old, or, um, you know, they're, they're not able to get a good one, or just the part of the tumor they tested maybe had high levels of B7 and then other parts of the tumor didn't. It's a variety of different factors that can, um, you know, determine that. Um, but I would postulate that those, uh, that complete response group probably had high levels of B7. Uh, the median progression-free survival, and once again, this is a median, this is 50% of the patients in the trial. Uh, what the median progression-free survival is, is uh, when 50% of the patients in a trial have their cancer return. Um, from the start date, and that was 5.8 months. So obviously some patients will be longer than that. Some patients will be a little sooner, but the average is 5.8 months. The median overall survival, which is the same um, sort of statistic, except for uh, the surrogate or the uh, the measure is death, not just recurrence. Um, and, you know, 12.12 months, it's an extra 12.12 months for these patients that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and importantly, at the time of publishing, 9% of patients remain on treatment. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that's fairly significant. Um, I would suspect that having this drug at an earlier time in the treatment and having the patients heavily stratified um, would probably result in better results. Mm. Um, and I'm sure there's many drug companies making similar drugs that target the B7H3 home lock. So, um, you know, as with all TDXs or with all ADCs, um, it, you know, there was some 
toxicity, but I think any drug is going to cause serious toxicity in a late stage small cell lung cancer patient. Oh, well, there is the late uh, stage factor yeah, too. And it's just a horrible disease. Um, it spreads very quickly. Uh, it goes into different organs. Um, you know, it's a really tough disease to treat. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the grade three and above, which are the ones that are, you know, more serious, um, was observed in 36.4% of patients. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, definitely some side effects in that patient population. I suspect those side effects would be much more tolerable at an earlier stage. Um, and ultimately, you know, this, this is just another example of, uh, you know, patients with heavily pretreated small cell lung cancer can now have, uh, you know, a new approach. And it's another, uh, you know, it's another example of an ADC making huge differences in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The key here uh, always is uh, there's so, so many kind of extra bits and pieces that are important to understand. Given how many clinical trials there are for new cancer drugs in the world right now, uh, or combinations of drugs, over 100 thousand of these clinical trials, um, you know, six plus thousand of these ADCs in, in uh, you know, phase two plus trials and development, mm -hmm. many with a uh, FDA approval already, and lots of other treatment options as well. Um, especially if you're starting to get into late stage, the key is uh, to to uh, extend your life as comfortably as possible now and keep an eye on what's new what's, what's new, coming yeah. um i mean for decades there were no new drugs really or just kind of a new kind of um a new chemotherapy uh drug like systemic full full body chemotherapy drug uh, for decades um mm -hmm. but right now literally every week new targeted therapies or antibody drug conjugates are being uh approved by the fda um, and therefore your doctor could prescribe them or, you know, they're a little further back in development and you could access them through clinical trial if you're properly stratified. Um, so, you know, obviously more time is important uh, and better quality of life is important. And this is an example of a drug that's helping very late stage patients with no other options to have more time and for the most part, well tolerated. Um, but one of the other benefits here is that it the, the more time that you get, the more likelihood there is that something new is going to be developed. It's going to give you even more time or, or greater benefit or put you in that complete response group. Um, mm. really. The more time you buy, the more time you get. The more options. The, the more the, options, yeah. Options. And it's, it's all just, I mean, this is another piece of our work in trying to get this into, and when I say our work, I mean the, uh, you know, the scientific community and the medical community in general, it's just another piece of trying to turn this disease into a chronic disease rather than a deadly one. And yeah. I think we're going to be we're going to be achieving that. And we are achieving that now in various stages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With greater frequency than ever before, for sure. And it, and the key, of course, is genetics, understanding, as we were saying earlier, being able to know for a fact that that drug is going to serve you is a very important thing. Even if you're mm -hmm. not late stage, you really don't want to be on treatment that's not going to benefit you as much as it possibly can. Um, you just don't. You don't want to be wasting time or dealing with un unnecessary side effects. Um, so being properly stratified, making sure you have thorough genetic testing um, and uh, that whatever treatments you're exploring really are going to benefit you most. It's the it's the best way to make sure you're not wasting time. But it's also the easiest way uh, to get a prescription from your doctor for these new treatments. Um, if you've taken it upon yourself to get thorough genetic testing and you're providing your doctor with the evidence that these are the things that really that you need, all the science says, these are the molecular features of your cancer, and these are the drugs that are going to serve you best. It's much easier to get your doctor on board with something that they otherwise may have never heard of yet or wouldn't know to offer you. Um, and that's really what matters most, is that you're always on the very best treatment and that it's as easy as possible for you to get it. On that note, uh, you can book in a call with Alex, uh, have his team review your medical records, do some personalized research for you, and help advocate with your doctor for these new options. You can visit our YouTube channel. There's new videos coming every week, so do hit the button and subscribe. Um, and by all means, you're welcome to 
to email us any questions that you have. Our mission really is to make sure you are as well informed as possible of all your options and that you know how to access them. We have an education and advocacy program um, for that very mission. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that we can help you get the information you most need to live the longest, healthiest life. life. So um, uh, yeah, I think that's all you wanted to say about this video. That's all I wanted to say until next week. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. More videos coming every week. Next week. Uh, new, new things next week. Yes. Okay. Take care. Have a good week.